Hi, welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. I'm Chris Rycroft, and in this video, we're going to introduce the LU factorization method that allows us to write a square matrix in terms of the product of a lower triangular matrix and an upper triangular one. The LU factorization method is really useful for solving large linear systems of equations, and it's the primary method that's employed by scientific software libraries for solving linear systems. In this video, we're first going to look at how to carry out a LU factorization method, and then we're going to look at how to use it to solve linear systems. A familiar idea for solving matrix problems is to use Gaussian elimination. And if we're given a linear system AX equal B, then the idea is to transform this into a triangular form. And in this part, we'll make use of two different triangular matrix definitions for matrices that are n by n. We'll define a matrix U to be upper triangular if its entries Uij are 0 for i greater than j, and we'll define a matrix L to be lower triangular if its entries Lij are 0 for all i less than j. So why are triangular matrices good? Because triangular matrices are actually very easy to solve. So suppose that we have a matrix problem of the form ux equal b for an upper triangular matrix u. Then we can solve this system directly using back substitution. If we look at the final entry of this linear system, then that will just give us that xn is equal to bn divided by unn. And that's something where we can immediately then calculate what xn is. If we now look at the penultimate line in this linear system, we'll have that xn minus 1 is equal to bn minus 1 minus un minus 1 comma n, xn, all divided by un minus 1 comma n minus 1. And since we've already solved for xn, we can now solve for xn minus 1 as well. And following this procedure, we can then just explicitly calculate all of the components of x. Similarly, we can use forward substitution to efficiently solve lower triangular systems of the form Lx equal b. And if we look at the first row of this linear system, we'll have that x1 is equal to b1 divided by l11. Now if we look at the second row, we'll have that x2 is equal to b2 minus l21 x1, all divided by l22. And since we've already found x1, we can then directly evaluate x2 and we can continue in this fashion all the way down to xn. So back and forward substitution can be implemented with doubly nested for loops. And the computational work will be dominated by evaluating the sum from k equal 1 to j minus 1 of l, j, k, x, k. And we have to do that for j equal 1 to n. So in each one of those, we'll have j minus 1 additions and multiplications. And that will therefore give us 2 times j minus 1 operations for each j. And therefore, the total number of floating point operations that we have to do will be asymptotic to the sum from j equal 1 to n of j, all multiplied by 2. And that will be equal to 2 times n times n minus 1 divided by 2 and that will be asymptotically equivalent to n squared. And here, when we use the tilde symbol, we're referring to asymptotic behavior. And specifically, if we say that a function f of n is asymptotic to n squared, then what we mean is that the limit as n tends to infinity of f of n divided by n squared is equal to 1. And it's worth comparing this to the big O notation that we've already used in this course, when we looked at Taylor series expansions. And we would say that a function f of x is big O of g of x if there exists a positive m and a value x naught such that for all x greater than or equal to x naught, we have that the magnitude of f of x is less than or equal to m times the magnitude of g of x. So we have now two different ways to talk about asymptotic behavior but there is a small distinction, and in this situation, we prefer to use the tilde form because it also tells us about the scaling of the leading order term. And for example, suppose we look at 
the function f of n is equal to n squared divided by 4 plus n, then we would say that f of n is big O of n squared, but we would write that f of n is asymptotic to n squared divided by 4. And hence the latter expression keeps that quarter scaling of the n squared term. So transforming ax equal b into a triangle system will be a sensible goal, but we have to now look at how we can achieve this. And one observation we can make is if we pre-multiply ax equal b by a non-singular matrix m, so that we get m a x equal m b, then the solutions to this linear system will be the same. So what we could do is we could derive a sequence of matrices m1 up to mn minus 1, so that if we apply all of these matrices in turn to our matrix A, we could convert our matrix A into an upper triangular form. So this is really what we do in Gaussian elimination. And if we do this, then we will end up with transforming our system into ux is equal to mb, where m is now the product of all of these individual mj components that we applied. We'll show shortly that if ma is equal to u, then m inverse is actually a lower triangular matrix L. And therefore, we obtain that our matrix A can be written as L multiplied by u, so it's the product of a lower triangular matrix with an upper triangular matrix. And this is called the LU factorization of A. And the LU factorization is the most common way of solving linear systems. And if you are using NumPy's linals.solve command, or MATLAB's backslash operator, then chances are that you're actually making use of the LU factorization. And if we have a matrix problem A x equal B, then that can be now written as LU of x is equal to B. And so now suppose we let y equal ux. So therefore, we'll have the LY is equal to B. So we could solve that to find y using forward substitution. And then we could go back and solve ux equal y using backward substitution. And that would then give us our solution x. So the next question is, how do we determine that sequence of matrices m1 up to mn minus 1? And we need to be able to annihilate select entries of A that are below the diagonal, so that we'll obtain an upper triangular matrix. And to do this, we'll introduce the idea of an elementary elimination matrix. And we'll let Lj denote the jth elimination matrix. And here we're going to switch to using Lj instead of Mj, because these elimination matrices are actually lower triangular. Let x denote the matrix after step j. So we'll have, therefore, that x is equal to the product of Lj minus 1 times Lj minus 2 up to L1 applied to x. And we'll write that x colon comma j is equal to the jth column of x. And we'll now define our matrix Lj to be equal to ones along the diagonal. And then in the jth column below the diagonal, we'll have terms of the form minus xj plus 1 comma j divided by xjj down to minus xnj divided by xjj. And if we think about the action of this matrix Lj on the jth column, then it will eliminate all the terms beyond xjj. To simplify notation, we'll write that small lij is equal to xij divided by xjj. And then our elimination matrix Lj will become equal to ones on the diagonal. And then in column j, below the diagonal, we'll have terms of the form minus Lj plus 1 comma j down to minus Lnj. And we refer to these terms below the diagonal as a subdiagonal. So now we can apply our elementary elimination matrices to A in order to convert it into triangular form. And we'll do this one column at a time. And we'll illustrate this for a 4x4 four four matrix A. And after we apply our matrix L1 to it, then we'll have zeros in the first column below the diagonal. And after we apply L2 to it, we'll also have zeros in the second column below the diagonal. And a key point here is that when we apply a elimination matrix LK, it has no effect on columns 1 to k minus 1. 
And therefore, as we proceed with multiplying by the factors Lk, we'll introduce more and more zeros below the diagonal. And after n minus 1 steps, we'll therefore end up with an upper triangular matrix. And specifically then, we'll have an upper triangular matrix U that's equal to the product from ln minus 1 up to L1 applied to A. Finally, we want to compute our factorization of A equal LU. And we'll therefore have that L is equal to the inverse of the product of our matrices from ln minus 1 to L1. And using a standard identity, we can write that as the product of the inverses from L1 to ln minus 1. And while this might look rather complicated at first sight, it turns out to be rather straightforward due to two strokes of luck. And the first stroke of luck is that the inverse of a matrix Lj can be written down rather simply. So if we have our matrix Lj, then to get its inverse, all we need to do is flip the signs of the terms in the subdiagonal in column J. And we'll now look at why this is true. So let's define that small Lj is equal to the column vector of the subdiagonal terms in our matrix Lj. And therefore, our matrix Lj can be written as i minus small Lj times Ej transpose. So now let's look at the expression of Lj multiplied by i plus small Lj Ej transpose. And if we multiply this out, we'll get some cancellation, and we'll be left with i minus small Lj Ej transpose, small Lj Ej transpose. And we could now look at the product of the second and third terms here of Ej transpose multiplied by small Lj. And since small Lj only has terms below the diagonal, it is actually zero in the jth position. And therefore, this dot product of Ej with small Lj will actually vanish. And therefore, we see that Lj multiplied by i plus small Lj Ej transpose is just equal to the identity. And we can do this the other way around too, and we can find that i plus small Lj Ej transpose multiplied by Lj is equal to the identity. And that therefore confirms that the inverse of Lj is just equal to i plus small Lj Ej transpose. Now that we have a simple expression for our Lj inverse, we want to look at the matrix L, which is a product of all of these inverses from L1 up to L minus 1. And so let's look at two terms in this product, where we look at Lj inverse multiplied by Lj plus 1 inverse. So we can write that out as i plus small lj ej transpose times i plus small lj plus 1 ej plus 1 transpose. And if we multiply the terms, we'll get i plus small lj ej transpose plus small lj plus 1 ej plus 1 transpose. And then a cross term, which is small lj times ej transpose times small lj plus 1 times ej plus 1 transpose. And if we look at that final term, we know that Ej transpose times small lj plus 1 will evaluate to 0, because small lj plus 1 has a 0 in the jth position. And we'll therefore get a simpler expression that this will just evaluate then to i plus small lj Ej transpose plus small lj plus 1 Ej plus 1 transpose. And one thing that's interesting here is that the ordering matters. If we were to look at the expression Lj plus 1 inverse multiplied by Lj inverse, then we would not get that final term cancelling away, because we would end up with multiplying a unit vector Ej plus 1 transpose with the column vector small Lj. And since small Lj actually has a non-zero component in the j plus 1 position, that would not vanish. So the ordering is really important here. From here, we can actually extend to additional factors of Lj. And if we look now at a product of Lj inverse, Lj plus 1 inverse, Lj plus 2 inverse, then we find that those subdiagonal terms simply just collect additively. And therefore, we obtain our second stroke of luck. And we find, then, that our matrix L here 
just collects all of those subdiagonals of our elementary elimination matrices. And we end up with this very simple form where we have ones on the diagonal and then all of our small LJ terms in the columns below. With the mathematics established, we can now write down a basic LU factorization algorithm. And we begin by defining that U is equal to our input matrix A, and L is equal to the identity, and during the algorithm, we'll modify U and L to end up with the upper and lower triangular factors. The outer loop of our algorithm will involve looping over the columns J from 1 to N minus 1. And when we consider a particular column J, we will eliminate all of the entries below the diagonal. So when we're looking at column J, we'll have a second loop from i equal j plus 1 to n, where we consider an ijth entry in that column, and we eliminate that entry. And to do that, we'll have to apply row operations to our matrix that are due to the action of our matrix LJ on it. And that will involve a third nested loop from k equal j to n. Line 6 in this algorithm accounts for the effect of Lj on the columns k from j to n of u. And if we think about a k in the range from j to n, then we'll have that Lj applied to the kth column of u. We can write that out in terms of our matrix L, j, where we have ones on the diagonal and then in the jth column, we have terms below the diagonal. And we apply that to our kth column of u. And if we do that, the result will be we get the same column of u. But for the terms beyond u, j, k, we'll have these additional subtractions of the form minus l, j plus 1, comma, j, applied to u, j, k down to minus lnj applied to ujk. And we'll note here that if k is equal to j, then that will eliminate all of those terms beyond ujk. So the LU factorization involves a triply nested for loop, and therefore we end up with order n cubed operations. And if we carefully count the number of operations, then we find that it requires n cubed over 3 additions and n cubed over 3 multiplications, and therefore 2 n cubed over 3 operations in total. Now we can look at what's required to solve a matrix system A is equal B, and it will require the following three steps. So first we need to factorize A into L and U, and that will take asymptotically two-thirds n cubed operations. Then we'll have to solve Ly equal b using forward substitution, and that will take asymptotically n squared operations. And finally, we'll have to solve ux equal y using back substitution, and that will take another asymptotic n squared operations. So we see, therefore, that the total work is dominated by step one, the two-thirds n cubed operations. We could actually consider an alternative approach for solving matrix systems, and that would be to compute the matrix A inverse directly. And then we could just evaluate our solution in terms of x would be equal to A inverse B. But in general, this is a bad idea. And one question we can ask is, well, how would we actually compute A inverse? Well, one way to do it would be to look at finding each column of A inverse separately. So we could write that A inv colon comma k is equal to the kth column of A inverse. And we can actually then find that column by solving the linear system of A multiplied by A in colon comma k is equal to the kth unit vector. And therefore, one way to compute A inverse will be to factorize A using the LU factorization and then do backward and forward substitution for each right-hand side vector, ek from 1 to n. But that would then require n backward and forward substitutions. And therefore, the total work would scale like 2n cubed operations. And that is inefficient. 
that's actually larger than what's required to do an LU factorization. And a general rule in numerical linear algebra is that it's almost always a bad idea to compute the matrix inverse directly. We can often get what we need via these different factorizations. So another case where the LU factorization is useful is if we want to solve our system AX equal B for several different right-hand sides. For example, BI from 1 to K. We'd incur the factorization cost of 2n cubed over 3 once, but then each subsequent forward and back substitution would only cost us 2n squared operations. And if we had a large n, then this would make a huge difference in practice. So the LU factorization is a really useful tool for solving linear systems. But there's actually a small problem with what we've introduced so far. And we can construct some simple matrices where the LU factorization can actually fail in its current form. And in the next video, we'll look at how to generalize the LU factorization to account for these cases and end up with a robust algorithm that can work across a broad range of matrices.